actually get started. So welcome everybody, it's so great to have you all here. We're excited to have this awesome class on Congress. We're gonna dive deep into Article One of the Constitution, the first part of the Constitution and with the original or structural Constitution, it's the longest section of that original Constitution. So my name is Curry Sautner. I'm gonna be your moderator and chat support as we go through today. And official question asker. That's my job. I just poke questions at everything. And I do a lot of that to you guys, but also to Tom Donnelly, our chief top scholar with us today. Tom, do you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, I'm, I'm Tom. Uh, great to see everyone. And I can't wait to dig into Congress. It is an exciting topic. This is a really fun one. And I think this is where so many people ask questions about what is the role of Congress? So here's some of our framing questions that go through today. What's the role of Congress? Um, where does it get its powers from and how does Article One really spell out those powers and what do they mean? Because sometimes, you know, things like Commerce Clause makes a little bit of sense, but not clear how it works in different ways. And we can look at the court cases around it as well. And then one of the questions I have, Tom, about this all the time is, is Congress working the way the framers in 1787 in, uh, in Constitution Hall, which is right behind me, or uh, Independence Hall right behind me, when they wrote, this is how Congress is going to work, does it work the way they intended it to? And is it acting the way they thought it would? So that's really kind of like, what were their original ideas? And how does it play out today? And then I love this class this week, because we're going to end with a really hot topic, constitutional question. So get ready for that, guys, at the end. So we want you to think about where is the power of Congress and what is its job to be able to answer that question. And then we're going to roll into all the different sections over time. So that's the big framing question. Tom, do you want to start off with a little quiz to kind of work up everybody's brains? That sounds perfect. OK, so let's do this. Here, I'm going to launch the poll. We stop share. Hopefully, you guys can all see the poll. So this is just, remember, we don't do uh, tests. There's no grading here. Uh, we want to just warm up your brain. So what is the primary function of Congress? Is it to check the president? make laws or appoint new Supreme Court justices. Remember the primary function, number one. Um, second question, what article of the constitution describes and explains the legislative branch, which is Congress? I always wonder, are there so many names for Congress, legislative branch, and then there's two houses, all those things. So is it article one, article two, or article three? Third question, what does the term bicameral mean? I feel like I always say that wrong. Um, is it two for each state, every other year, or two houses? And fourth question is, these requirements have to be met by which member of Congress? Okay, so House of Representatives or Senate. So here's the question. If you have to be 30 years old, you have to be a citizen for nine years and live in the state you represent, and your term that you serve is six years long. Is that the description of somebody that serves in the House or in the Senate? Okay, everybody's answers, put them in. Tom, walk us through the answers real quick. Number one, what is the primary function of Congress? It is to make the laws. And so, so, no, and so this is a tricky question, Curry, because the other two things are certainly part of Congress's roles. Congress is part of the sister, system of separation of powers. So sometimes it checks the president. And the Senate is involved in the Senate appointment process, but the primary role is to make the laws. Yeah, that, that's that tricky question, uh, tricky word, <laughs> primary. Exactly. <laughs> Second question, what article of the Constitution describes and explains the legislative branch? So Congress, is it Article 1, 2, or 3? Article 1 is Congress. So our, and then Article 2 is the President, Article 3 is the federal judiciary, but it's Article 1. Boom, boom, boom. Congress, President, and then the court. Very good. Um, what does the term bicameral mean? It means uh, two houses. It's the idea that we separate Congress into a U.S. House of Representatives and a U.S. Senate. Awesome. Perfect. And I know you guys have a lot of those questions on your quizzes and tests that you get, so I wanted to make sure we went over the words. And then last one, if you play this role, you're 30 years old is the minimum age you can do to get in. You to run for this position. Citizen um, for nine years, live in the state you represent, and your term, if you get elected, is six years. Is that a member of the House or a member of the Senate? 
that is a member of the Senate. All of those requirements are, are slightly different in the House. So the Senate is, is what that question covers. For the House, it is, um, it's, you must be 25 years old, you serve for two years, um, and you can run for re-election. But th th this particular question goes to the requirements of the Senate. I always just remember this, guys. I always think the House that doesn't actually skew younger, but you can get in at a younger age. Exactly. So House is shorter and younger, quicker to turn over was the idea, and, and younger to get in, more closer to the people. And then the Senate was kind of like the elevated branch. So you had to be a little bit older. Um, yeah, it, I think Nick said something like, it's a five, it's like almost like doubled or five years each grouping. So easy ways to remember it. I'm gonna end that poll. You guys did a good job. Now, Tom, our brains are warmed up. And we are ready to dive into all those pieces of Article One. Tell us, you know, what is, go over the big idea of Article One, and then we can walk through the difference between the House and the Senate, and then walk through the, um, the powers of Congress. Yeah, so the, so the big idea here for, the, for, for Congress is that, you know, the, the framers were looking to create a, a, a part of the government that was gonna make the laws. Now, as Curry said at the beginning, Article One is the longest part of the, of, the, of the original constitution. It comes first right after the preamble and the framers really expected Congress to be the most powerful, the most important branch of government. And what they were trying to do with Congress, and this is the really big theory, the big conceptual idea, was that this new Congress was going to be more powerful than the Congress that came before it. But they also wanted the Congress, though more powerful, to still be one of limited powers. And so there, it's, it's more power than what they found in the Articles of Confederation, the original framework of government, but also one of limited power. So they were going to set out specific powers as to what Congress was going to address. Um, this is a really delicate balance. It's really, really hard to figure that out. How do we make Congress work, but how do we also limit it so that it doesn't violate all of our liberties and destroy the traditional role of the states? So that's a huge idea. And I feel like that's like the theme always when they're writing the constitution, we want to establish a, a national government that has power, but not too much. And so they constantly put in things to check and balance those, but it also seems a little like flip floppy at the same time. So can you kind of break down for us? What's the job, you know, what's the job of the House and the Senate? And then what's the overall job of Congress? And we can do that in any way that you want. Sure. Let's, let's start quickly with the House and the Senate, and then we can move on to the powers. Um, so beginning, so again, bicameralism is this idea that we're going to separate Congress between two houses, a House of Representatives and a U.S. Senate. So the House of Representatives is, is it's, it's, it's uh, organized around the principle of popular sovereignty. So this means within the original Constitution, the American people, the voters are going to directly elect their members of the House of Representatives. So the, the if, you know, Madison in the, in the Federalist Papers speaks of how the House of Representatives is going to be the part of the national government that's closest to the people. And the idea here is that it's gonna be a short term, it's gonna be for two years. House members might run for reelection, but there's going to be churn over time. They're gonna to have to return to the people and defend what they've done. And so that's the House of Representatives. And more broadly, um, it's organized around the idea of population. And so the larger the state, the more representatives it has in the House of Representatives. And so altogether, there are 435 members of the US House of Representatives. And just to review what we said at the beginning, its members must be 25 years old. They serve for two-year terms. They can run for re-election. They've always been elected directly by the people. That's the House. It's the people's house. It's supposed to be closest to the American people. That's the House of Representatives. The US Senate is organized differently. So one, it's organized around the principle of equal state representation. So this, may, this means no matter how big your state is, you're going to have the same number of senators. You're going to have two US senators. So whether you're from California, which is really big, or Rhode Island, which is very small, you have two senators. That means there are a total of 100 total US senators today. Senators must be 30 years old. They serve for six year terms. They can run for reelection. They were originally selected by the state legislatures. But after the ratification of the 17th Amendment in 1913, the U.S. senators are now also directly elected by the American people. So that's a bit about the House and the Senate. Um, do we want to move on to the powers now of Congress more broadly, Curry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Rhode Island isn't the smallest state. It has two representatives. Yeah, so Iman, that's a, that's a great point. Iman was just reiterating what you were saying. Even if you're a small, a smaller state, you still have two. And that was a... Uh, that was a deal that they made at the Constitutional Convention. 
that they would have two houses to be able to make a compromise that, you know, you have the power of your population and you have the power because you're represented overall, correct? So I want to say the Connecticut compromise, is that right? That, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, that, that's interesting, Chris. So like if we're looking at the convention, Congress is the body that, that framers discuss the most. And the two, two of the biggest uh, um, decisions they made were one to separate the Congress into two houses. The other being that we're going to split the difference between a U.S. house that is going to benefit large states. So if you're a larger state, you have more representatives and a US Senate organized around equal representation, which means that all states, regardless of size, are represented the same way. That's the Connecticut Compromise. That's the Great Compromise. Awesome. So now saying, OK, they got this big compromise. They have two things. What's their job? So overall, what's the power Congress has? And did the framers think that Congress would be really powerful? They absolutely did. They thought of the parts of the national government, it was going to be Congress that was the most powerful. Part of that was what I said about the U.S. House of Representatives at the beginning, was that the U.S. House was going to be closely connected to the people. And in a government where the, the, the basic principle is we the people, popular sovereignty, the thought was going to be that Congress would be more powerful than the other branches of government. But, you know, if we're, if we're looking at the constitutional convention, the founders really battled, they really thought hard about how is it that we're going to define these powers of Congress? You know, they look back and prior to the Constitution, we had the Articles of Confederation. And what do we know about the Articles of Confederation? Well, they were quite weak. They couldn't do many of the things that, the, that, that so many of the framers at the convention thought a national government needed to be able to do, be able to speak with one voice in foreign policy, one voice for the nation, to be able to, to collect taxes and then spend for the general welfare, to really be able to regulate commerce between the states. And so as the framers are coming into the convention, they're thinking, what are the different flaws that we saw in the Articles of Confederation? And what specific powers do we want to give to Congress to make sure that Congress is speaking for the nation in areas where we think that is so essential? And so as we're going into the convention, what frames this debate over the powers of Congress? Well, like many things, it ends up being James Madison's Virginia plan. So the Virginia plan, Madison lays out at the beginning of the convention. And what he, what he has in there is a general principle that's meant to guide the discussion. And this is the general idea that we want Congress, we want the national government be, to be able to speak to things that are genuinely national issues. I was rustling around my papers because I, I wanted to get the specific language. This is what Madison's Virginia plan said. Congress should be able to legislate in all cases to which the separate states are incompetent or in which the harmony of the United States may be interrupted by the exercise of individual legislation. And so the idea is there's a broad principle that guides the convention at the beginning. We want a Congress that can speak in areas where we think it's essential for the national government to speak. And then as the convention goes on, the delegates fill in the specific powers that we see in Article 1, Section 8 that Curry had on the screen. And so the idea is it's, it's, it's not enough because we're afraid of Congress. We're afraid of the national government to just lay out this general principle we want to get the specific powers written into the Constitution so we can also hold Congress accountable when we think it's extending beyond its constitutional powers. So do we want to take through a couple of the most important powers here, Curry, and then move from yeah. there? And I just like that is such a good point that you make, though, because when you when you, it's written in the Constitution, it's not just affording powers or giving power, but it's also confining the power, too. And I think that's like a really fascinating way to look at it. We look through the constitution to say, can they do that or can they not do that? Um, so I think that's a really interesting way to look at the both like the positive and the negative of power um, and the duties around that branch. So I wanted to reiterate that because I love those big theories that follow through of how do we look at the constitution and know if the power is there or not there. So yeah, let's look at some of these big ones, especially thinking about that final question today. Can Congress pass a national law that makes everybody mandate a mask? So thinking about that in our head as an example, we can look at some of these powers uh, and say, where could the power come from or where could it be confined? So cool. Go ahead, John, which one do you want to jump with? I always love the Commerce Clause, but we don't have to talk about that. Well, you, 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 you can't go wrong with the Commerce Clause. I mean, just to highlight a couple of the really big powers here, Curry, the ones that will really debate a lot over time in American history. One is the Commerce Power, like you said, Curry. And we could go, I, I actually want to spend a lot of our time today sort of walking through the battles over the power to regulate commerce, because that's so much of the constitutional debates we see from the beginning of the American Republic to today are over that and one can clause. You 
can we, so I always say like, and if nobody probably knows this in this group, but PV Herman used to have like these moments or like Sesame Street used to have these moments where you said the word of the day and everybody cheered. Um, but for everybody, Commerce Clause, um, can you define what commerce is for our students too? Sure. So the, it is a contested question throughout American history, Curry. Um, I mean, just in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So commerce, usually when we think of commerce, we think of economic, economic relations. You know, you know, when businesses are doing things in the economy, the marketplaces, when we have different products go, going across state lines, things like that. That's, that's, you know, commerce. You know, throughout American history, what have these debates, debates been over? Well, it's, you know, does commerce cover regulations of railroads going across state lines? You know, that's sort of one thing. Does, does, this, does this idea of commerce, does it allow the national government to say something about the rules that should govern workers in businesses, even if they're within a single state? Can the government actually say, you know, what's the minimum wage? How many, what's the Got maximum it. number of hours? Things like that. So these are the sorts of debates over time where the court's gone back and forth about how to answer that question. So real simply, it's like buying, selling, moving, and making stuff. Yes, with the court at <laughs> times saying that it's all of those things and only a few of them. So it's, it's you know, it. the, cool. what, what, the categories, it's actually covered by the Constitution. It expands at times and it gets smaller at different times. Got it. I just wanted to make sure we all understood what commerce was. It's like selling, buying, making, building, and moving stuff. Yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. What's another big one? So another big one is that first one, that to, the power to lay and collect taxes. So this is Congress's power to tax and spend for the general welfare of the nation. And so over time, this was one of the things that the Articles of Confederation couldn't do, but is absolutely essential for the government to be able to take in money and then provide things that we think are important for the American people, whether it's a, a national defense, an army, you know, whether it's economic programs, like today we would say something like social security, um, or et cetera, et cetera. This is at the core of so many of the things that the national government does. So that's commerce, the power to tax and spend. Just a couple of those near the end, Curry, the power to declare a war, to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a Navy. These things are all giving Congress a key role in defining um, the national government's role in keeping us safe, um, mm -hmm. in protecting against foreign enemies. Um, and so this is, again, this is something that the Articles of Confederation struggled to do and that we really wanted the national government to do. And these are areas in which we'll see big, big battles between Congress and the president. The president saying that I am the one person that speaks for the nation in foreign affairs and national security. And Congress saying, no, Mr. President, look at Article 1, Section 8. We have the power to declare war, to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a Navy. It's a job for both of us. Um, so that's, awesome. that's, that's sort of regulating foreign affairs and the military. The last one you highlighted there, Curry, is so important, and that's the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. Um, so this is what some people refer to as the elastic clause in the Constitution. So the Articles of Confederation were limited, the powers of Congress were limited to just the specific things written in the Constitution. And what the necessary and proper clause says is that we have to read all of those powers in you know, a more flexible way than that. And so there's been great debates throughout American history about how flexible the necessary and proper clause is. But the basic idea is that this clause gives, gives Congress the power to you know, do things that help it carry out its other duties. So you know, it, 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 it can do other things beyond. So for instance, the big debate in the early, early American history was over um, the Bank of the United States. Could Congress charter a Bank of the United States? Obviously in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, there's no charter bank clause. It's not a clear question just based on what's written into the Constitution, but what John Marshall said, what Alexander Hamilton said, what George Washington agreed with, was that the power to charter a bank is related enough to the other powers in Article 1, Section 8, that it's within the powers of Congress. Now, James Madison, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, others disagreed with that, but that was the argument that Marshall, Hamilton, and Washington made. Awesome, so we kind of walk through a lot of the power that's in there do we wanna really quickly look at some of the, like real quickly uh, go through the limits on Congress before we dive into some like action by Congress over time? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. So, so article one, section nine speaks to limits on Congress. And these are, you know, these are pretty important things. So, you know, the first one there, it's, it's, it's relating to the international slave trade. So it's saying Congress will not have the power to ban that prior to January 1st, 1808. So that's a clear limit on the powers of Congress. But then we see other things that maybe we don't think a lot about today, but are actually really important to the core of what America's about. Look at that last one, bans on titles of nobility. In America, we are not going to have 
an elevated class of, 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 of elite given titles like sir or gentleman or anything like that. We are all Americans, one single group of people. Uh, and this, this for us really distinguishes us from Europe. And it's, it's a real statement about, there is no equal protection clause in the original constitution, but this is an expression of core, a, a core, core notion of equality within the United States. Um, but sort of each of these things you know, are, are meant to sort of reinforce limits on congressional power. That's Article 1, Section 8. Art then if we just flash forward one more step, Curry, to Article 1, Section 10, we then also, Congress will set out certain limits on the powers of the states. And so again, when we're thinking about congressional power, it's another way of thinking about that question of federalism that we've returned to so many times. Which powers to the national governments? Which powers to the states? And these are some specific ways in which the national constitution wanted to limit the powers of the states. So it wanted to make sure states couldn't enter into treaties with foreign nations. This is again, the idea that we want the national government to speak with a single voice on the world stage. We don't want states coining their own money. We want the national government to have a control over, uh, over our national currency. We don't want states to impair, uh, in, impair contracts. And so this is the idea that the national government is gonna have a primary voice often in big economic decisions through commerce, cr commerce power. And we wanna make sure that states are respecting a lot of those economic relations within their states. And then the final thing there is Article 6, which is a supremacy clause. And what that's really just saying is that the constitution, the laws of the United States, our treaties are superior to state laws. Now, what we, what's the one question we always have to ask, Curry? First, we have to ask, okay, there's a law on the books. Does Congress have the power to do that? We always have to ask that question because Congress's power is limited to what's in the Constitution. But if Congress acts in a way that is constitutional, that law ends up being superior. It strikes down, it strikes against all laws passed in the states and at the local level. And I think that's so fascinating. So Congress could pass a law and they could say, well, this is a supreme law because it's a national law. But then the states could sue against it and say, but you don't have the power to do that. And that could strike it down, correct? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. And, and that's happening okay. throughout American history. Yeah. <laughs> so what I want to dive into next is how a bill becomes a law, since that's the primary kind of role of Congress. And it's, it's tricky. It's not easy. I think what your statement was, Tom, and I love it, it was it's slow. It's slightly painful, it's difficult, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So Exactly. I'm the, the, oh, sorry, Gary, the word, the word Madison liked to use was complicated. It was complicated. Complicated, yeah. I like to, um, yeah, I love complicated. It is complicated, um, and it, that's a good thing. Sometimes, you know, making it hard makes it better. Um, and I, that's what I think Madison really had this idea. If I make you really have to work for it, you'll appreciate it and get something better at the end of it. I feel like my parents used to say that to me too. Okay, again, <laughs> Tom, tell us how a bill becomes a law. Yeah, so it's, it's a very demanding, a very slow, a very frustrating process, as Curry said. But the basic idea is that a bill is gonna start in one House of Congress. It's gonna work, a, a, you know, a member of Congress is going to present it to the House. It's gonna work its way through the process in the one house that often requires the bill to go to a, to a committee, which is a smaller part of Congress. That committee will debate it, they'll revise it, eventually approve it, send it to the house, to send it to the floor of that, that part of Congress. Um, and then that one house, let's say the House of Representatives votes on that bill. If, that, if the House of Representatives approves of that bill, then the same process has to happen in the Senate. So what's the basic idea here? The basic idea is that every bill is going to have to pass the U.S. House of Representatives, and it's going to have to pass the Senate. For spending bills, they have to start in the U.S. House under the Constitution, but for any other bill, it can start in either House. But it has to pass the House, it has to pass the Senate. Once it does, Congress then sends the bill to the President of the United States. This is the requirement of what the Constitution, what we refer to as presentment. The bill has to be presented to the President, and then the President has a choice to make. The President could sign that bill. If the President signs the bill, it becomes the law, or the President could veto the bill. If, they, if the president vetoes the bill, the bill then goes back to Congress. So when the president vetoes, the president saying, no, I do not want this bill. And then the bill goes back to Congress and Congress has a decision to make. If both houses of Congress vote by two thirds of each house uh, to say, no, no, we want this bill to happen, the bill still becomes law. If Congress is not able to get a two thirds vote in each house, then the bill dies, even though it's passed both houses. So this is a really, really demanding process where if the president vetoes a bill, Congress really is going to have to be able to find the support probably in our day of members of both parties to say we disagree with the president. That's very, it happens sometimes, but it's very unusual. 
So that's how, once that happens, you know, the, the, let's say the bill passes both houses of Congress, the president signs the bill, it's approved, it becomes law. That's not the end of the story because even then, people can come to the courts and challenge that bill and say that it's unconstitutional and the courts will get a say then using its power, using the court's power of judicial review to say whether the law is constitutional or unconstitutional. As you said, Curry, this is a slow process. Madison said a complicated process, but it was designed that way. The theory here is that we want to slow politics down. We want politics to slow down. We want to promote conversation in Congress. We want to promote compromise. We want to guard against powerful factions passing laws that other people don't like. We want to go about a, a politics that's governed by consensus. And because of that, a bill has to survive both houses of Congress, a presidential veto, judicial review, this whole process. And the idea is that we're going to reject bad laws, sort of revise flawed ones, and then refine good ideas because in the end, we want this process to create national policy that serves the common good. And that's the big theory. And I think that's amazing because there's so many steps in this process and it feels like more than any other to make sure if something isn't actually good, there's a way to push back on it like over and over again. And you're like you said, a way to refine it. So I'm gonna throw out Yvonne's question because I really think it's a good idea to jump into these next court cases. And I know we need to hit like the new deal era and then get to that final question. But the question is, have, have there been any cases on whether the power implies a duty or a duty implies a power? In my opinion, a duty implies a power, but, the, uh, but not the other way around. And that makes me think at what point in time, if Congress can't get this done, are they not doing their duty? If they can't get a national law done, can they be almost held accountable for not doing their job? Um, but then we, I know we have a lot of work that happened or a lot of congressional power that happened during the New Deal and the courts were involved as well. And there was a lot of push and pull back and forth to write better laws. Um, so do you want to question New Deal? Where do you want to go next? <laughs> so I'll quickly touch the question and that's a good way of moving into the New Deal. So the question, that's a great question. I think under the theory of the constitution and throughout American history, the way we've looked at that question is that we're gonna let elections take care of it. We're gonna, it, it ends up being a sort of a theory of electoral mm. accountability where if we think Congress isn't doing what it should be doing, if, and frankly, if we don't think the president's doing what the president should be doing, they will be held accountable at the polls. And that's, that's big. the court has been reluctant to step in to say that any government at any level has an affirmative duty to do something. But I do think that the way, in, it, it, and, and let's go to the New Deal, because this is a great question, because we, what we see throughout American history is a push and pull between wanting Congress to do more and pulling back and saying we want Congress to do less. So the New Deal, you know, this is that key period where, you know, uh, FDR is president, we have the Great Depression, we have one of the greatest economic crises in American history. And we see the government doing more than it had done before to address it. So we see big economic programs, things that we still have today, like social security, but these programs are challenging people's conception of what the government should do. And so, you know, if we're, if we're looking at where does the New Deal fit into the broader sweep of American constitutional history, we see a, a first period where we'd say it's dominated by the Marshall Court from roughly 1801 to 1835, where John Marshall and, and his court are reading Congress's powers fairly broadly. They're, you know, they're saying that, you know, the Marshall Court saying the government is a government of limited powers. We're going to read those powers in a way that gives Congress, you know, a pretty big responsibility to, to uh, promote economic growth. I think that's how you would talk about the, about the Marshall Court. It says that a, a national bank is okay, Congress can pass that, and that the commerce power uh, is fairly broad. So that's sort of the Marshall Court in a nutshell. If you then fast forward to the Gilded Age, the period that's right before the New Deal, you see the court pushing back against this, this idea. Um, so, you know, in the late, late, late 1800s, early 1900s, we see an explosion of new laws passed by state governments and the national government addressing big changes to the economy, big factories, big businesses, powerful railroads, new hazards to workers. And so we see more and more laws passed, but we see that the courts quite naturally saying, don't there have to be limits to what governments can do? Government's never done quite this much before. Is the way in which we can make sure our national government is still a government of limited powers. Now this entire period is known as the Lochner era is usually what constitutional scholars call it. It's named after that first case there, Lochner versus New York, which is where the court struck down a law, a New York law that was regulating uh, working conditions for bakers. But you know, that's a state 
state law, but more broadly, we also see the Supreme Court trimming back on the powers of the national government under the Commerce Clause and under the Necessary and Proper Clause. And the big idea here with this, this era is you still see the court upholding many more laws than it strikes down, but you're seeing the court really try to find, are there, is there a limiting principle? Is there a way we could limit the powers of Congress? And we see in the New Deal, the, the co Congress doing more and more and more. We see the Supreme Court initially fighting back, trying to say, you know, Congress, you're doing too much. You're writing the laws too sloppily. You're coming into areas that we've traditionally associate with the states, like the rules governing workers, things like wage laws, hours laws, worker safety laws, things like that. And, you know, we are going to, we're going to, you know, try to enforce those limits on Congress. But then we see what many constitutional scholars call a constitutional revolution of sorts. It's often called the New Deal Revolution of 1937. And we see the Supreme Court shift dramatically and sort of reject the Lochner era before it and begin to read Congress's power under the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause really, really broadly. We're beginning to say, we're beginning to see a court that allows Congress to do a lot of things it hadn't done before. And Curry, you highlighted the right case right there, Wickard versus Kilburn. <laughs> I think put... this one's kind of crazy. I mean, I think I'm, a, I would call it the butterfly effect case. Like a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon and Commerce Clause is affected. <laughs> That's my running joke yeah. on this one, but explain to the students this, and this picture down here of the wheat farmers really connected to Wickard. Um, but lay out this case, because I think it's going to be an interesting one to look at when we look at the final question in one minute. So you got one minute. <laughs> uh, one minute's easy enough. Okay, so this is a case in 1942. <laughs> the farmer is a, a farmer named Roscoe Filburn. And uh, what he's done is, you know, he, he's, he's growing wheat on his farm, and he's using that wheat to feed his animals. He's not selling his wheat in international, you know, any, any sort of interstate commerce. He's not selling his wheat to anyone. And the question is, can the national government tell Mr. Filburn, no, no, you can't grow quite as much wheat as you want to grow. And this, is, this comes under a national law called the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Um, and frankly, under the case law that would have happened before 1937, the court would have said no. Of course, the con Congress can't step in and tell Mr. Filburn what to do. This is wheat on his farm. It's in, it's, it's in his state. It's not being sold anywhere else. Where does Congress get off saying anything? But after 1937, this is now 1942, the court says, no, Congress can do this. Congress can tell Mr. Filburn how much wheat that he can grow. Why can, they, why can they do this, even though he's not selling it in interstate commerce? Well, because Mr. Filburn is choosing to use his own wheat rather than going out and buying it elsewhere. And if he does this and other people do this, this is going to greatly disrupt the wheat market. It's going to make prices... Uh, you know, it, it's going to affect the prices of the wheat market, and this is going to upset the entire large congressional scheme of regulating the wheat market. And so, again, Curry, I think you're right, it's the butterfly effect. It's the idea that it's not just what Mr. Filburn is doing, but it's that if we look forward at what other, if other people are doing the same thing, it's going to have a massive effect on interstate commerce, even though it just happens in a single state on a single farm. Now, kind of jumping into that hypothetical, and I know we kind of skipped some other modern cases that push back on Filburn, but um, here's a hypothetical. So does Congress have, <laughs> have the power to pass a law requiring everyone to wear a mask during a pandemic? So gang, I want you to answer in the chat, but remember, I'm gonna remind everybody, this isn't a political question or a policy question. So it's not, the question isn't should, the question is, does Congress have the power so are they given the power to pass a law requiring everyone to wear a mask during a pandemic? So I know briefly we went through necessary and proper. We went through commerce clause. There's a few others that we could cite here. Yes, no, maybe it depends. Um, we know that there's a lot of gray here. So we're going to let everybody answer really quickly. Maybe, I always like a maybe. <laughs> That's always where I go. Um, yes, because it is necessary and proper. It is for the common welfare. Nice answer. And then James, that was Iman. And then James said, yes. So anybody else keep chiming in there? I tell me, no, there's no simple answer for this, but break it down for us as much as you can. Absolutely. So yes, I think the best answer in certain ways is it depends. It will depend. But there's a way in which we could really understand and predict how, how the Supreme Court will at least analyze the case. Um, yeah. So, you know, one, one, one thing to note is, you know, this is the sort of thing that we would traditionally look to the states to do. So this falls right within a state's traditional police powers to promote the health, safety, and welfare of their residents. And so under Supreme Court doctrine, 
uh, a case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts from 1905. Um, you know, th this, this would be well within a state's power to do. But the question now for us is, a state can do it, that's fine, but can Congress do it? And if so, where is Congress getting the power to do it? Because remember, while the states have that police power, Congress doesn't. It doesn't have a general power to promote the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. The Congress is, uh, the national government is a government of limited powers, and Congress has to be able to tell you, this is where I'm getting my power from. And so what are some of the candidates here? Well, we've talked about them today. You know, the, probably the most obvious one would be Congress trying to link this, this broad mask mandate to the commerce power. And so, you know, what we know about the commerce power is that Congress will have the power to, um, you know, uh, pass laws that regulate channels of commerce, persons or things in interstate commerce, or as we saw in Wickard v. Philburn, activities that will, in the, in the aggregate, have, a, have an effect on interstate commerce. And so what Congress would say here would be that, of course, a pandemic is going to have a huge effect on the economy. It's going to have a huge effect on all interstate commerce. And that this is precisely the sort of thing that's in the, right at the core of Congress's commerce power. Um, and that's going to be especially the case if Congress um, ends up writing the, the mandate in a way that goes to economic activity. So if it's really tied to people going to work, people going to businesses, things like that, Congress would say that's within real, really the core of the commerce power after the New Deal. Now, the other side, the, the con of this argument is that what we've seen in recent years from, 19, uh, from 1995 onward is that the Supreme Court has begun to strike back against the broad reading of the commerce power that we see after the New Deal. And this is cases like United States versus Lopez and the first Obamacare case. And what the court is trying to do is they're trying to say, Congress really is a body of limited power and we're going to try to find principles to limit that power. We, the idea being, we, we can't go further than Wickard. Wickard went so far, I think in the back of some of the justices heads, it may be like the New Deal may have even gone too far with Wickard, but we're gonna try to find ways to limit Congress's power. What the court said in the first Obamacare case, a majority of the court was they tried to say that Whereas under the commerce power, Congress can regulate commercial activity, it can't regulate inactivity. And so in that case, it said that Congress under its commerce power can't force people who don't want health insurance to have health insurance. And so I think under this, this part of the argument would be that the court could similarly try to find a limiting principle to say that here Congress is going too far. So that's the commerce clause argument. The other key one, I think, Curry, um, uh, is would be under, there, there's a, the, that Congress could make an argument under its uh, power to tax and spend for the general welfare. And this is, this is where Congress could pass a law basically saying through some combinations of carrots and sticks that we want states to pass mask mandates. If you do it, we'll give you federal money. If you don't do it, we may take away some money from you. And the court has generally read this power for Congress pretty broadly, but there are limits to its power. The, con the, the Congress has to be acting in a way that promotes the general wel welfare. It has to give the states really clear instructions saying this is exactly the kind of mandate you have to, that you have to pass and this is exactly what's gonna happen if you don't. Of course, Congress can't violate other parts of the constitution like the Bill of Rights. And finally, the court said that the Congress can't actually coerce states to do something. And so this is the idea. The penalties can't be so great that you're really forcing the states to do something they don't wanna do. So, okay, so two other questions, because they came in in the chat, some other options. Um, so Iman said, what about the general welfare? Could they use, could they use that line as the, the general wealth, they're, they're promoting the general welfare, so that's why they could do it. I will throw out necessary and proper always. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have a question on, um, was uh, Wickard v. Fillmore ever kind of pushed back a little um, since the case? So there are your three questions real quick. So three questions. General welfare. The, the, when the court when the court a, a applies that, it's usually tethered to the court, the uh, Congress's power to tax and spend. And so the, the Congress again can do quite a bit to promote the general welfare if it's doing it through its tax and spending power. And that's sort of how the court has cabined it to ensure that Congress is indeed one of limited powers. You're right, Curry. The other real big argument would be about the necessary and proper clause. You know, the way the court usually looks at the necessary and proper clause is that it's not really an independent source of power, but what it does is it sort of expands the power associated with other parts that are written into the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It gives Congress, you know, some flexibility in terms of uh, different means of carrying out its duties under those other powers. So here, I think you're yeah. right, Curry. The most natural argument would be commerce clause plus necessary and proper clause equals broad mask mandate is okay. I think that's the way that, you know, the, you know, Congress would probably make that argument 
Um, uh, so that, that's totally right. But it, it, we should say that, that the meaning of the necessary and proper clause and how broadly it applies is still contested between conservatives and progressives and different constitutional voices. And it's one of those classic debates that lasts throughout American constitutional history. Um, and then your last, the last question was about, you know, have, has the court pushed back at all on Wickard v. Filburn? And so, yeah, I think the best example of this, if, if you fast forward to, you know, sort of the late 1980s and onward, just Chief Justice William Rehnquist becomes Chief Justice of the United States, and then John Roberts becomes Chief Justice. And what we see is a push by the Supreme Court to what the title here is the new federalism, which seems really grand. Uh, but, the, but the idea here is that, the, that uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Roberts, many of their colleagues are trying to figure out ways in which we can limit the reach of the New Deal revolution. So, you know, if we're looking at what's the big picture idea here during this period, the court is still saying Congress has broad, broad, broad power under the Commerce Clause, but they're trying to find new limits on that power. And if we're looking at Wickard v. Filburn, the, I think the, 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 the best case in terms of the court wrestling with that question is United States versus Lopez, where there it's dealing with the, the uh, you know, the, the Gun-Free Schools Zone Act, um, and you have someone who brings, a, a student who brings a gun onto school grounds um, that the, uh, that student is then prosecuted under a law passed by Congress um, that says you can't bring guns within a school zone. And, and Mr. Lopez ends up challenging this law saying that this law exceeds the powers of Congress. It's more than Congress they can do. It's unconstitutional. How does this relate at all to Congress's commerce power? And what the court said basically was, Mr. Lopez, you're right. We have found one place in where we, in which it, we, we really have found a limit to commerce, uh, Congress's commerce power. This really has nothing to do with economic activity, and it's not directly uh, connected enough to international interstate commerce that there's such a huge effect that it that that that, um, that Congress can pass a law like this. Now, this was a really big deal. This was the first time. So I think what was this? This was 1995. I think this was the first time since 1937 since that revolution in the New Deal that the court struck down a law passed by Congress under the Commerce Power. So it was a really important uh, statement by the Supreme Court that we will still find limits to Congress's commerce power. Um, but again, even after Lopez, we still do see the Supreme Court upholding many more congressional exercises of power under the Commerce Power than not. So it's still, Congress still has a very broad power there, but we do see the court willing in certain times to say enough, that's too far. Awesome. So as we look at this question, we, you know, as per usual, we don't, uh, uh, what about um, the Obamacare case is the one that uh, we pointed out on one, Monday. Yeah. That's, that's, the other, that's the other case that you're talking about, Iman, there that could say it pushed back on both of those cases kind of not roll back what could be Phil Bohr, but, but shrink it just a little bit. Um, but like Tom said that there's, there's not a ton. It's still much, much broader. But when we think about this question in the next two months, three months, a year, we might see this question actually pop up. We might see Congress pass a law. So what we always want you to do is look at that constitution and say, where is the power or where are they overreaching in their power, that branch of government and what, what is the case? And be that like constitutional scholar and lawyer and say, this is where I think it's strong and this is where I think it's weak, which you guys did an awesome job in the chat doing that today. Tom, thank you so much for class today. Is there any kind of big thing you want the students to walk away with on the on how Congress works? Well, I think the two, the two big things, Curry, are one, it is a slow, frustrating process. So if you see that in the news, it really is. It was designed that way. And the theory was that it was going to promote deliberation and compromise. So really, I think when you're looking at Congress day to day, that's, that's the thing to have in mind. Is it fulfilling that particular theory? The other is simply that Congress, like so many other parts of the government, it's a balancing act between trying to create a government that can work, but also one of limited powers. And we see that in the constitution itself when it comes to Congress in Article I, and we see it in the debates over time over the scope of Congress's power at the Supreme Court. Awesome, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, students, have a great day. Um, and it was a big one, so sorry we ran a little long. <laughs> have a great day, thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye, good answer in that question. I love this constitutional question this week. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, if I had more time, definitely I would have done NFIB Sebelius because that's another, Obamacare is another example of pushing back for sure. I need to put like the common way we know the cases sometimes in there. So everyone, because I have to be honest, I forgot that was a drill name too. I was like, oh, I do know that case. Thank you guys. Awesome. Very cool. Okay, awesome. Okay.
next time, I will see you 2 p.m. Eastern time, same channel. Do you want to do reverse? Do you want to start with a big question and then reverse it on the high school or no? Yeah, we could, I mean, we could try that. I would say don't even, don't, we shouldn't do a quiz with the high school. If, I, I think if anything, let's maybe just wrestle with the, with the hypo. I, I think so too, because I think it's like warming up their brains, but um, the high school, they're ready to dive in. <laughs> their Thanks, brains are Lorelei. already hot. <laughs> Thank you, Lorelai. Have a good day. Um, cool, that works. Yeah, I put it in there as a backup with sometimes the high school kids are like, why didn't we do the quiz? <laughs> Also, if Jeff is ever late, it gives me something to fill in if Jeff's late. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally why I do it. <laughs> I was like, curry's filler time. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, I will see you at two. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. All right, thanks, Curry. Thanks, everyone.